want to come to this country and make a life for themselves. And in spite of all of that, in spite of being, you know, the very model of, of, what, uh, of what Peter Dutton might want asylum seekers to be when he's not busy uh, demonizing them and, and saying that they're taking jobs and, and taking welfare and things like that. When he's not demonizing them, he's painting a picture of what they should be. And this family couldn't be closer to that picture. And yet in spite of that, Border Force comes into their home in the middle of the night and tears children from their beds, puts them in a van, separates them from their parents, put them on a plane down to Melbourne and lock them up for months and months on end. And when they've been locked up, we've had little girls celebrating their birthdays behind bars. We've had them develop infections in their mouth so severe that a it just turns your stomach to think of them and yet still not being given the medical treatment that they need and they deserve Same. and recently as we all know they were moved from Melbourne and put on a plane to Darwin and then put on a plane to Christmas Island where they've been locked up again Same. and so we're here today along with thousands of other people in major cities all around the country standing in solidarity with this family because this is an absolute disgrace. We cannot let it continue. This is happening far too often and people who deserve our care are being deprived of it and that's not acceptable. So I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we've all come out today and we're gathered on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, the, traditionals, the traditional owners of this land, land that was uh, never ceded uh, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Uh, before, I, um, before our first speaker, um, sorry, I'll just introduce our first speaker. Um, and that's Kelly Hughes. Kelly has been uh, an advocate, an advocate for uh, refugees and asylum seekers and oppressed people for over 40 years. She's a, a fantastic active member of the Refugee Action Campaign in Canberra as part of the faith-based working group. Uh, and if you're a, a person of faith and keen to get involved as well, uh, have a chat to Kelly or any of us on the stall afterwards and you can get more involved because that's what's going to, to win this, getting more people involved and getting active. Uh, so without further ado, Kelly, uh, would you like to say a few words? I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional. I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners. Okay? Good. And I'd also like to thank so many of you for coming out at such short notice. Right up. So first of all, thank you everyone for being here today. It's been a long campaign of persistent advocacy for the rights and well-being of people seeking asylum in Australia. Back in February, RAC held a rally for this family from Biloela. Ros Delzeal, who is also a member of the faith-based refugee group, spoke at that rally, and much of what I'm about to say comes from the talk that she gave then. She would have loved to have been here today, but she sends her good wishes to everybody who was able to gather. Of our most me immediate concern today is that small family from Biloela in central Queensland, Priya, Nardes and their little daughters. Nardes arrived in Australia from Sri Lanka by boat in 2012, Priya in 2013. They met, married and had children, both born in Australia. In Biloela, where they were living and working for more than three years, they were loved and appreciated as valued and contributing members of the community. One of Mother Teresa's most famous sayings is this, not all of us can do great things, but we can do great things, small things with great love. And that's just what the people of Biloela have done. Members of that small Queensland town of around 6,000 people began a small, in a small and caring way. They welcomed that Tamil couple and then their children into their community until the 
WhatsApp family was suddenly removed from their home by armed police and border force at 5 a.m. one morning 18 months ago. And their friends in Biloela did not take that lying down. They were shocked and they were outraged. This was not something they had ever encountered nor expected and they were not prepared to passively accept it. The campaign led by Angela Fredericks and others to bring Priya and Nardes and their family back to Biloela started as a very small thing and it's grown to something much greater. But despite courageous and intensive advocacy, the family were confined in immigration detention in Melbourne for more than 18 months, far from their Australian friends, with the prospect of imminent deportation looming ever larger after their appeal was lost in the federal court. During this extended period of detention, there were many reasons for concern about the family's well-being. The worst was probably when the younger daughter, the Runica, only a toddler, de developed such serious tooth decay that in July she had to have surgery to remove four of her baby teeth. Mm. If you, like me, have seen the photos mm. of her mouth, they are images you will never forget. As a mother myself and as a grandmother, I was appalled. Victoria's Commissioner for Children, Leanna Buchanan, said that it was a deeply distressing case and showed why it was unacceptable to have any child in detention. Since their removal from their home, people from Biloela travelled all the way to Melbourne to visit and support them. Over 150,000 people signed a petition calling on Minister Peter Dutton to bring the family home to Biloela. The population of that town is less than 6,000 people. Throughout Australia, rallies have been held to call on the government to release and return them to their community in Biloela. And now we learn that last Thursday night, the family was removed from immigration detention, put on a plane in Melbourne for apparent deportation. When an urgent injunction was granted, the plane landed in Darwin where the family was kept, we understand, on a military base. Now they've been flown to Christmas Island, probably the only de detainees being held there. The family understandably are traumatized. The children are extremely distressed. To many Australians, it looks as if Nardes, Priya and their children are being treated as pawns in some cruel and sinister game of strategy. The Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Immigration have been contacted many, many times by Australian citizens expressing deep concern. The Minister for Immigration could use his discretionary powers to end this and enable the family to return to the rural town where they had settled and where they would be welcomed with open arms. Former, former senior immigration officials and the former leader of the opposition have confirmed this. Many small rural communities in Australia are struggling in need of newcomers who are young and hardworking and wish to make a contribution. Nardes and Priya clearly fitted that bill, recovering from the trauma that led them to flee their country of origin and make a new home amongst us. If you have been following Australian treatment of refugees and people seeking asylum in recent years, you will be aware that in the middle of the night, in the small hours, officials may burst into the rooms where asylum seekers are sleeping. As has happened all too frequently, they may be seized, often handcuffed, and taken to the airport. Their belongings will be packed up by officials. Their children will be terrified. They will be terrified. They may be flown back to offshore detention, a place of trauma, or deported to the country they fled. This is how things are done in Australia today. Shame. In East Germany nowadays, the dreaded headquarters of the secret police of the Cold War is just a museum that anyone can visit. In Australia, the treatment of people seeking asylum is reminiscent of cruel regimes that our democracy says it abhors. 
a modern democracy does not need to scapegoat vulnerable people in order to cohere as a nation. I represent the Canberra Faith-Based Refugee Action Group. It's a group of many faiths. Um, the majority are Christians, but there are people of other faiths as well as part of that group. Many people of faith throughout Australia are deeply shocked by our government's prolonged inhumanity to people seeking asylum. And we cannot understand how professed Christians in government can treat vulnerable people like this. Yeah. Minister for Home Affairs Peter Dutton has stated that this couple from Biloela have brought their trouble on themselves by coming to Australia illegally. However, it is not illegal under international law to seek asylum if you are in fear of your life. The government has changed Australian law to make it illegal to come to Australia by boat to seek asylum. Sri Lanka suffered a bitter civil war for some 25 years arriving from ethnic tensions between the Sinhalese majority and the Tamil minority. This war ended in 2009 when government forces gained control and defeated the Tamil Tiger rebels. Over 70,000 people were estimated to have been killed and both sides accused each other of continuing atrocities. Priya herself witnessed a terrible atrocity. A constitutional crisis in October 2018 demonstrates that political instability continues. Human Rights Watch reports that the Sri Lankan government has stalled in investigating alleged abuses, enforced disappearances and in working towards reconciliation. The Australian Department of Foreign Affairs Smart Traveller website advises that security forces maintain a visible presence, particularly in the northern and eastern provinces where where many Tamils live, with military and police checkpoints and roads closed without warning. Landmines are a continuing danger in the northern and eastern provinces. Human Rights Watch reports that many people are still displaced after the conflict, some due to military occupation of their land and others forcibly removed with no regard to UN guiding principles for relocation. These are the conditions that Priya Nardes and their family would face if deported. Worse than this, The Guardian reported in 2018 that human rights groups and legal advocates have serious concerns over the, face, over the safety of returned asylum seekers. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights wrote in a report in July 2018 that Sri Lanka's progress towards peace had virtually ground to a halt and he had heard evidence of very brutal and cruel methods of torture. The people of Biloela who are advocating for the safe return of this family to their community have very real grounds for the concern of their safety and their prospects if, defo if deported. We join with the residents of Biloela today and other, concerns of, and other concerned Australians to urge Minister David Coleman to use his cons discretion to, sorry, we urge Minister David Coleman to use his discretion to grant this family safe haven. As Bill Shorten advocated on ABC News yesterday, let them stay. Jesus is the founder of my religious faith. He was a refugee child taken by his parents to Egypt. As a toddler, he barely escaped a terrible atrocity against children in the town of his birth. He lived to preach compassion for all who suffer. As a nation, we should li listen and act. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. For that Kelly and I don't know about you all but I am pretty sick and tired of politicians like Scott Morrison who want to wear their faith like a shield against criticism and it's not a shield for him 
It's a stain of hypocrisy. The fact that he can get up and be in pictures of him in church right around the country to make himself look like a good Christian while he locks up children is a disgrace. But countering that disgrace is the hope that I feel when there are so many wonderful people of faith like Kelly who are involved in standing up and saying that people like Scott Morrison don't represent them, don't represent their faith or their religion, and are doing something about it. Our next speaker today is someone who knows all too much about the Australian immigration regime. Um, Zaki Hadari is a refugee and an active member of the Canberra Refugee Action uh, Campaign. Uh, so he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what his experience has been like. Um, thank you for coming here today to, su to show your support for people like myself. I came to Australia at the age of 17 and I was detained in Christmas Island for days and months and I know how it feels because you're in isolated island you don't have access to the community we don't I hope the people I hope Priya and Nadas can see your support today this is the only thing that keeps those people going gives them hope that at least Australian community are out there and support them. We do. We do. We do. We do. And it means a lot for them because being in a prison, you don't have anything to go or hope for. Saying that I have lived in the community while I was released from detention center for three years on bridging visas, where my visa was expiring every six months. At night, I couldn't sleep because I had the same fear that they had that when the police or the immigration will come and take me away. And this is just an example of how it happens. You're just asleep in the middle of the night if you could sleep. I feel for the kids that don't know what's happening with them. I feel for them on how horrified they will be being taken away separately from their family by a police or a guard and be taken to a detention center. Because I have seen it, I have experienced it. It's horrible being yelled by a security guard or a police officer because you're a refugee and you left your country just to survive. And for those kids who are Australian, for my, in my opinion, they haven't done anything wrong. Their, their family were in danger, they left the country. They were born here and they're still experience, experiencing the experience of their, their father and their mother. I don't have much to say. All I can say is it's just awful and heartbreaking. Living in Lambo for years, having the fear that when you will be sent back to detention center being detained back with no hope and no time frame on how long you will be detained for. And the main, I think the main fear that you have is when you will be deported back. Every time that you've been taken on the plane, you know that if the, the moment you land your country, the danger will come to you. You know, even those hours and moments that you're spending on the plane, waiting for the plane to take off, it's just horrifying. They were very lucky to have Australian people on the street to stand for them and do not let them to be deported. But they still have that fear. They're still living with that fear in every moment, every day. So thank you very much for coming out today. and Keep this fight going. They need you, and we all need you. We fight together. Thank you very much for coming.
Thanks for that, Zaki. And we've uh, we've been here before um, on the lawns of Parliament House or elsewhere around Canberra uh, in protest for the actions that this government has taken to demonise and to lock up and to torture refugees. We've come out all too often. And I know that a lot of people are probably tired of coming out and feeling a bit hopeless. No. 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 Well, that's bloody good to hear. <laughs> and it's so important that we do keep coming out and we do draw strength from each other because we know that when we come out and we know that when we come together, we can be powerful. It's not an accident that Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton sent uh, this family from Biloela to Christmas Island. They sent them there because it's harder for them to talk to their lawyers. It's harder for them to see that there are so many people in the community that care about them. The fact that this campaign grew out of a little town of less than 6,000 people and has spread right around the country is testament to the power that we hold as a community when we come together and stand up for each other. And that is a power that frightens Peter Dutton. It frightens Scott Morrison. And it's frightened some of their colleagues as well. We've heard that even people like Barnaby Joyce have said that this family should stay. We've heard people like Alan Jones saying that this family should stay. And we all know a broken clock is right twice a day, but come on. The sad fact is that Things are happening like this all over the country and they're happening right here in Canberra as well. And there's someone who wants to say a few words about a family who are facing deportation at the moment who are living right here in our community. Yes, that's good pleasure. Um, my next door neighbour, uh, he's not his Australian family, about to be thrown out of the country. Oh. And they've been thrown out on a bogus medical technicality on the misapplying of old regulations. Um, uh, Sydney has a hepatitis B, which of course is now very easily dealt with. A tablet a day, doesn't present any medical problems, not a burden on the community. The regulations were changed on, in July when that was sort of finally recognised. And on August the 6th, she was informed that her and her uh, son Billy are to be deported. And, uh, and we've um, gone to the minister and uh, to Dutton and Dutton is refusing to reopen the case. Um, and what's particularly bad is they've been here for 10 years. Oh, Billy is an Aussie kid. Like he's, only, uh, he's only just turned 12. He can hardly understand or speak Vietnamese. Mm. And that's where he's going uh, at the end of this month. So an appalling situation. And what uh, you, you can do about it is um, look up Sydney Vaux. Sydney spelled S-I-D-N-E-Y Vaux find her in, um, in, in Facebook and spread the story around to as many people as you possibly can. Okay, thank you. And a few months ago, there was a, another member of our community, a young man living in Queanbeyan uh, named Kinley, who was going to be deported uh, because Kinley's deaf. And the government thought that it would be too expensive to allow him to stay uh, with permanent residency over the course of his life and access to health care and support that he has a right to access. Uh, and so they wanted to deport him. Shame. And so we came out again, as we do, and we stood up for Kinley because we're members of his community and because, you know, he just has a right to stay here. You don't have to know someone to believe in their right uh, to, to you know, just have a, a decent life and decent access to health care. And we came out and there were protests and we won and he was allowed to stay. And that's the power that we hold. And a few months after that, uh, quite quietly, the government changed its policy about uh, allowing people with disabilities to stay in the country and seek permanent residency. And they changed that policy because, not because they thought it was right to or they felt, uh, you know, burdened by their conscience, but because we came out and we showed them that we're not going to tolerate that sort of nonsense anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So friends, we've won before, we can win again, we will bring them home, we will let them stay because this family has a right to. 
And uh, in, in terms of rights, you know, the rights of children are something that, that tend to come a lot, uh, come up a lot in this debate. And our next speaker uh, is a long-time advocate for the rights of children, uh, paediatrician uh, Dr Sue Packer and Senior Australian of the Year. Uh, so thanks, Sue. Right, it's still quite terrible to be here, and I think, like all of you, right up closer like that, yeah, well, it remains still terrible to be here, um, and to realise just how much has happened in less than the last 48 hours, to wake up yesterday morning, to realise that our worst fears have been founded, and this family was then, I think by that point, landing in Darwin. Um, I think what sickened me even more was that short video clip of their mother being restrained, being told to be calm because it was all okay, separated from her children, hearing her children hugely distressed and not able to go to them. I think it was reinforced for me because I was flying back from Townsville yesterday in a plane with lots of little families on it. Mm. Little children don't like long plane flights, even when they're accompanied by caring, supportive parents who can devote all their energy to keep them supported. And when you've got the, plane, the people on the plane also supporting them, it's still an ordeal. For these children, even this last phase of the life, the calculated separation from the parents to manipulate more control over the parents um, to get them onto the plane really doesn't bear thinking of. Um, the other image that came to mind for me, thinking about Australia and Australian values, was the picture of Mrs Petrov being dragged from the plane by the Russian guards a long time ago in my childhood. The huge difference here is the people dragging this family are Australian, ordered by Australians to do these abysmal things. Um, and it really continues to devastate me. I've been worried about these children ever since I heard of the Dawn Raid when they left Bilalila. Even at that point, and I'd been aware of it before in, refu in detention centres, the whole idea of coming in the middle of the night when people are asleep, to put them at their least, at the most defenceless time of the 24 hours, unable to get things together, unable to focus on comforting their children, and then to end up in the detention centre in Melbourne, which is an abusive environment for small children. All the things that ought to be happening, the wonderful things that ought to be happening in the first few years of a baby's life, cannot happen in that environment. They can't, you've got, to begin with, you've got stressed and worried parents. They were stressed and worried a bit and Bilalela still, but they had the community to help them become more confident. In an environment where there's nobody to help you to become more confident, where you can't relax and delight in your children, things are bad to begin with, when on top of that you can't even do the everyday things, when these babies had no opportunity to meet with other children and do all the things that little children do, learn to play with other children, go to play groups, get appropriate health care, for children to end up with that degree of dental decay is absolute proof of the failure to provide even basic health care that all babies in Australia require. So, on every count, these children have been subject to levels of emotional abuse and physical neglect because of their living circumstances, over which their parents have had no control. The only people able to change this are the people responsible for the decision to put them in the detention centre in the first place, and they have paid no attention to this at any stage. These children are going to have the legacy of this no matter what happens for them from this point. But to return to a country which very legitimately has instilled both their parents with a deep 
an abiding fear and mistrust. There should never be a question of ask, asking the parents to return to this environment. And I think the final bottom line, even if this had been done in a measured and careful and hard to refute way, the final part should always have been to treat this family with respect, tell them of the decision, support them in every way possible to minimise any trauma. Instead of that, we have behaved in a way which made me think of a rather horrendous conference I've just been attending in Queensland looking at the worst forms of abuse against children in the world and the manipulation of children. And here are we in this country manipulating children in a very similar way and I am quite devastated at the moment to be Australian. Thank you. It does make you feel ashamed to be Australian, especially when we see these kind of policies that lead to things like children being torn out of their beds, that lead to families being separated and put in separate cells and separate vans and not being able to see each other. When we see these policies being taken up by governments around the world, we see it at the, the US-Mexico border where Donald Trump is separating families. We see it throughout Europe where uh, there's a hardening of, of border and, and a militarization of borders. And this is all stuff that these governments, these right-wing authoritarian governments have learned at the heel of the Australian government because we've been doing it for years and years. And yes, we're here today for Priya and Nardis and their two little girls, but we're also here because we want to see a different kind of country, a country where we don't lock up children, where we don't separate them from their family, where everyone has access to a safe and happy life with the medical treatment that they deserve. You know, this is the kind of country that we want to see. This is the kind of world that we want to see. And that's what we're fighting for as well. And friends, that's why we keep coming out. That's why we keep doing what we do because there is so much at stake. If we want to see that society, we have to keep coming out, we have to get more involved, we have to keep spreading the word that this is not acceptable, that this is not normal. We're not going to stand for it, we're not going to accept it, and we're going to keep fighting against it until we win. So I want you to follow me in a little chant, you may know it. Say it loud and say it clear, refugees are welcome here. Say it loud and say it clear, refugees are welcome here. Say it loud and say it clear, refugees are welcome here. Say it loud and say it clear, refugees are welcome here. And refugees are under attack, what do we do? Stand up like that. When refugees are under attack, what do we do? Stand up like that. When refugees are under attack, what do we do? Stand up like that. What do we do? Good on you. Thank you all so much for coming out. It's Father's Day. Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton will be spending their day with their families. We want them. Today's the beginning of National Child Protection Week. Far out. So we came out to urge these politicians to step in and use their discretionary powers to make this family safe again. But we shouldn't have to be doing that. We should be fighting for a system that doesn't put all the power in the hands of these authoritarian, jackbooted thugs. We should be fighting for a system that puts the hands in the power of people like us and communities because we have shown time and time again that we want to look after people in this country. Yeah. Yeah.